Um, so we are going to move on uh, with the program and uh, the next speaker is Baozhen Zhan from the uh, University of uh, Washington. So Baozhen, the floor is yours. All right, great. Let me share. Can folks see? Yeah. All right, yes. great. Okay. Yeah, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, very happy to be here. So I will talk about uh, using machine learning to for a problem called frequency control. And that's a joint work with I still Wenchi and uh, who did you know most of the work, right? So as Ram said in his talk, as if you look at our grid, our grid is changing from a grid that's dominated by you know synchronous generators, these big synchronous machines, to a grid that will have a lot of renewable resources that's connected by inverters, right? So if you think about resources like solar storage, electric vehicles, when all of these are connected by power electronics instead of ha us having a lot of synchronous machines. So this actually uh, changes how we think about the grid. Actually, we need to think about the operation of the grid in new ways. And in this talk, I'm gonna talk about something called frequency stability. So I'll talk about how should we leverage the fact that we have this inverter, these power electronics, to control to have to achieve better frequency stability. So if you look at the transition from say you know synchronous machines on the left to power electronics on the right, so of course we're going from a system that's not sustainable to a system that's much more sustainable, much cleaner. But from the engineering perspective, or from the sort of second to second operation perspective. Then one drawback of one potential drawback of a system dominated by inverters is we'll have so-called lower inertia, right? Because if you look at a system with lots of generators, then typically what we have is we have you know, hundreds of generators. These are big machines with a lot of storage capabilities. Now we're moving to a system where we have you know, millions of devices all spread out in the system. Each of them have some storage, but typically a lot less storage. So we're going from a sort of problem that's, uh, you know, that's sort of in some sense, a lot of inertia, a lot of damping to a system with less inertia. But the plus side, the advantage of the inverters is that we're, the synchronous machines are slow. They're not very flexible. These are huge moving turbines. Whereas power electronics are much faster and they're much flexible. So in this talk, really as the last part I'm gonna explore, I'm gonna say that you know, having flexibility in designing how these resources respond to changes in the grid is really beneficial. It will overcome you know, some of the negative, potential negative uh, things of having lower inertia. And inertia or uh, so sort of this frequency shows up because frequency really is the sort of major indicator of the state or the health of your grid. So this is showing the Texas blackout earlier this year. And if you look at the frequency in the grid really goes, you know, starts at 60 Hertz, but then as you drop generation, the frequency goes down and then the operators need to take more and more dramatic actions, right? They start to shed load, the emergency controls, and one thing to keep in mind is that the frequency really needs to be keep kept within a relatively narrow bit, right? So, you know, we start taking emergency load shedding once it gets to say below 59.5. So 0.5 Hertz is sort of the really the band we want to keep the frequency at. Right? So this of course doesn't really just happen in the this sort of big catastrophic blackouts. It also happens at other cases. So for example, you know, we had a Nordic system where disturbances cause frequency to again dip to quite low, right? So there's the, uh, the frequency is 50 Hertz and it dropped up to 49.7. And the interesting report from the Australian system has basically they had an event where the frequency dropped. And if you read the report, it's sort of showing some shades at the, uh, wind farms. It basically says nine out of 13 wind farms didn't respond enough. And then with sort of this undertone that maybe if they were synchronous generators, they would have responded more. 
right? So there is a concern that you know renewables would they respond to the grid? Would they do frequency response? And of course, FERC got into the action, and uh, FERC said, you know, essentially it's that renewables has to do frequency response, has to do primary frequency response. So if you look at prim primary frequency response, what does that mean? Right? So a synchronous generator, the way it does frequency response is basically by measuring the output, the frequency, and then doing negative feedback control. Okay? So this generator will try to make you know, the frequency deviation from 60, then change its power input. So if you look at a block diagram, basically it's a simple linear feedback control. You do a linear droop. And then if you look at this in a graphical way, it's saying that let me, so the change in active power injection, is just a linear function of the frequency deviation. Okay, so this is how synchronous generators uh, does frequency response most of the time. And this in some sense is what's keeping the grid stable right? because it's measuring, uh, doing negative feedback control by measuring the frequency deviation. But if you look at this control setup, then one question you can ask is, okay, I'm a synchronous generator. I'm doing uh, linear feedback control. And the question is, you know, linear feedback control laws may not be often, right? depending on what our objective is, depending on our system setup, this linear control law may not be good. So in the past, this has been somewhat of a sort of vacuous question because for this big synchronous generators, you know, they're limited by their physics to do this kind of linear feedback control. So whether it's good or bad, that's sort of the things, only thing they can do. Whereas if you move to inverters, the question gets a lot more interesting because inverters being electronic devices can realize almost any arbitrary loss. It can do whatever we want to program into it, right? So it can do arbitrary loss, but because it can do can you realize arbitrary control loss? Then the interesting question comes down to what should they do, right? So if you have a, a linear group, then you respond linearly. But if you can now, if you can do anything you want, then it's up to then sort of a engineering design question, right? What should the loss be? And uh, once we say you can do arbitrary loss, then really what we want to say is, you should do good loss, right? Your control loss should be optimal or close to optimal. And whatever your control loss we design, we want some properties. We want them to have some properties. We want the frequency deviations to be small. We want the, you know, we want the control cost to be low. We don't want to, for example, use up all our storage. And of course, we want this control loss to be stabilized. Right? We want the system after we implement this feedback loss to still be a stable system. So all these criteria together are actually not very easy to satisfy. Okay? And one reason it's not easy to satisfy is comes from the fact that our dynamical system is not a linear system. Okay? So a refresher on the dynamics as we're looking at the swing equation. So the swing equation really is saying that, you know, I have angle, the derivative angle is frequency. These are my state variables. Then I have sort of power flow equation. I have some inertia in the system, uh, some power injection from the generators or the renewables, and have power flow between the buses. And this power flow here, we adopt the lossless power flow setting, but it's still a nonlinear flow, right? So sign of the angle difference. Then our, the, our question, our control knob that we have to turn is really this U function. This is the static controller we try to design. This is our primary frequency response, right? So for the conventional generators, this will be a linear feedback. But then for our inverters, we need to design this, right? So FERC has an order saying we need to, all the inverters need to do some response. So the question is, you know, what should you be? Can we find the E? And this design question, there's sort of multiple objectives we can think of. So if you think back to the Texas blackout example, one thing you want to uh, minimize is this for frequency in the deep. 
right? You want your frequency to stay in a relatively close to the nominal value. Another thing we may want to optimize is maybe, you know, the rate of change of frequency. You may not want the frequency to change very fast in the system. So there's sort of various objectives we can have. And if you write them out in equations, then the idea is just infinity norm of the frequency and the rate of change is sort of the max of this. And we can use other metrics, but in this talk, we'll just look at the nadir of frequency. And then of course you need to trade off against control cost. So if you write out the optimization problem, then the optimization problem becomes important, right? And the optimization problem is interesting because we're solving something that's you know, not a quadratic objective. I'm trying to minimize the frequency deviation and then I'm trading off against control effort. So for this control effort, think of you know, the amount of power you're drawing from your storage or the amount of power you're drawing from solar, subject to my swing equations, my system dynamics. So if you look at this optimization problem, then there's no way a linear control law is optimal, right? It's not linear, this, the dynamics are not linear, the system is not quadratic, the, control, the costs are not quadratic, so a linear law is not optimal. But then if you ask to find the optimal feedback controller, that question is actually quite hard because it's not a convex problem, it's not a linear problem, and you're sort of optimizing over this function space, u as a function that we want to find. So the current strategy has basically even though you know, linears are not optimal and I can do anything I want, for me to really solve this optimization problem, let's just restrict it to linear functions because I don't really know what else to do. Okay. Then what you, what, what you do, uh, so if you say to linear, then it's basically you're leaving money on the table, right? Really what's going on there is you can do other things, but because we cannot optimize, we have to do linear control. So the question is, can machine learning help, right? If we, can we solve this, optimi this hard optimization problem using machine learning? So in this talk, I'll tell you, yes, there is a way to uh, use machine learning to solve this problem, use machine learning to find the best controllers. Basically, we should use a neural network to parameterize and find the response that we want. But the sort of the key thing is this cannot be a arbitrary neural network. And uh, I want to tell you is how do we sort of guarantee stability, right? How do we find a neural network controller that's guaranteed to make the system stable? And how do we make this robust, right? How do we make this performance robust? And turns out what this comes from is this will come from the well-known Lyapunov energy functions. So you, the reason that you cannot do a, you know, before going into what structure the neural network controller should have, let's look at what if you just do a naive learning strategy. So by naive learning strategy, what I mean is you can do the following very easily. Let's parameterize your controller as a neural network. Put in, you know, so suppose we know what the system is, we know the topology, the parameters of the system. Then let's run something like RN, right? So you can use reference learning. You can put in your controller. You can run bunch simulations. You can get the cost corresponding to the cost functions. And then you can update the weights in your controller. And you can do this using fairly standard algorithms. It doesn't take very long to code this up, right? So you can code this up in a day and run it and see how well it performs. So what happens when you do the sort of very standard approach? Well, so let's take a 39 bus system. Let's just run some RL on it. And uh, what you do is you run, you run, you train your RL and you quickly observe that it you know, performs fairly well during training. You can take the best linear droop control loss and this sort of standard neural network controller will beat it. Uh, will beat it by a fair bit. And then you look at your controller, it's, something like this. You measure the frequency deviation and uh, you, know, you do some response and this is what learning tells you. 
it's not linear, but uh, you know, looks okay, I guess. Then you can take this controller and put it into a system, and let's uh, say you do, you know, you 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 do some testing, right? Do some validation how well it does, and does very badly. Basically, your system is not stable. Okay, so during training, you thought you had a very good controller. You do testing, your system blows up on you. Okay? So that means whatever controller you learn is not very stable. Okay, this is not a stable controller. But from training, you could you it's very hard to tell. This is, you know, it's very hard to tell your, the stability of your controller. So really the question is, if you look at the optimization problem I want to solve, there is a constraint saying that the controllers I put into the problem should still be stabilizing. The entire dynamical system with this negative feedback should be a stable system. Then the question is, where does this constraint come in to our machine learning approach? Right, so where does it go in to this machine learning approach? And if you look at the uh, literature, uh, you know, in power and outside power systems control, there are some various ways of doing this. You can try to do a penalty on cost, right? You can look at, you know, if some trajectory deviates, you can put a large penalty on it. You can try to have some hard, uh, say hard, uh, hard initialization points for it to be controlled. You can do all this, right? So you can have this control, you can, uh, you can have all those kind of approaches. But these approaches come out to be a little bit ad hoc. And at the end of the day, they don't give you a guarantee because through this soft penalties, you don't know whether this will be actually stabilizing or not, right? So what we argue is really what you should do, uh, at least for this problem, the right way to look at it is you should constrain the structure of the neural network control. Right? You should put the constraints on the structure here. And so once, once you put the right constraint on the neural network controller, it turns out this will give you guaranteed stability. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the way to do that is through this sort of very standard approach called the Afnal functions, right? So stability in the system, you can think of roughly means the total energy in the system should be. Right? And the formal way to do this is to look at something called the Afnal functions. So the Afnal theory says, if you can find a function dynamical system that decreases, you know, we have dynamical system, if you can find a scalar function on it, that satisfy two properties, sort of positive definite, and decreases through time. Then if, if the function satisfy these two properties, then of course your system is stable because a positive function that decreases in time has to go to the equilibrium, right? So if you find this, and if, you, you're, if you're able to find this function, then you're done for stability. So the question you know, almost always comes down to how do you find this function? So for linear systems, this is quite simple. Right? The FNOR functions are generally quadratic and you can find them. For nonlinear systems, in general, it's very difficult to find a good FNOR function. It's very difficult to find it. But the good thing is we're, and our system is nonlinear. There is a sign term. Right. So, but the good thing is that we're not working with the arbitrary system, right? we're working with this power system, and there has been sort of decades of research into the Afnal functions in power systems. So if you look at this uh, swing equations, then there is a very well-known energy function, right? There's a very well-known energy function here. It's basically made of two parts. You have the kinetic energy and you have potential energy. And this function, or sort of, we have been looking at this function for a long time, right? Started from, you know, in the seventies. And uh, I think so I saw Pete here, right? So a lot of folks work on this energy function. So this is not quite a Lyapunov function because it's sort of unbounded below, but this is good enough when you restrict the angles between minus 90 to 90 degrees. So for our purposes, for our purposes, we're going to treat this as a Lyapunov function. Okay, so with this Lyapunov function in hand, this actually, what 
And with this left knob in a function in hand, this actually gives us enough algebraic constraints on the neural network controller we should use. Okay, this, this is good enough for us. The reason it's good enough is if you look at the swing equations and you look at those two conditions, then the positive definite condition give us the following. Whatever controller you design should uh, go through the origin. Okay, should go through the origin. And this sort of decreasing or dissipative condition tells you the sign of your controller, this U, should have the same sign as a frequency. So these are the two conditions. If whatever neural network controller you design satisfies these two conditions, then this, this sort of local Lyapunov function guarantees stability for us. Okay, so, so that's it, right? This are actually, these are the only two we need. And uh, you can, if you look at this for a few seconds, this, this is actually very easy to draw this in a graphical way. Right. So actually, so be, before going to that, let me say the formal, this, the, the formal statement is you can get a controller that's sort of exponentially stable if three things are satisfied. This UI has the same sign as omega i. This thing goes through the origin. And this thing is monotonic. Right. So these are the three conditions we need to give exponential stability. And this, in fact, sort of with a little bit more work, this is actually is an if and only if condition. So this is both sufficient and necessary condition here. Then of course your controller has other constraints, right? So if you're thinking we're using, let's say, as battery storage, there's many other constraints on the battery storage there. So here, what I'm showing, I'm showing the power constraint. So there's some maximum power your storage can offer yet. So this, you know, you can add in this power constraints. There could be SOC constraints, various other constraints. I'm not going to show them here, but you can add all of them in. Actually, it doesn't. So you make sure your controller satisfies all the stability constraints. Then you can clip, for example, the power of your controllers. Okay. So if you look at this graphically, the graph is actually quite simple. What is your controller? Well, if you plot out your controller, it has to cross the origin that has to be increasing. So think back to the synchronous machines case, right? We said we're gonna do linear droop. That's fine, that's a stabilizing controller, okay? That's fine, it stabilizes. It may not be optimal. So after learning, you may get a controller that looks something like this. This is also okay, right? It goes through the origin, it's increasing. This is not okay, right? So what you want to do is you want to rule out the controllers on the right. You don't want this, these things are not stabilizing. So you want, so this is the constraints we have. And again, as we said, if you have something like a power limitation, you just clip your control, you, uh, you clip your output satisfied power limitation. That does not change the constraints for stability, uh, right? So the other engineering constraints on the actual devices you have can be rolling to this. Okay? But in general, all we want to do is some function, the response should be some function, increasing crosses origin. So, and this is how, what we will constrain our neural network to be. And this is quite easy to realize using a neural network. So what you do is you take this function, you break it up into two parts. Okay? So you have a positive part of this function, you have a negative part of this function. And you can explicitly engineer the weights in your neural network to satisfy the increasing constraint we want. Okay. So for one example, I'm gonna show you as, I'm gonna show you a ReLU layer. Okay, I'm gonna show you a ReLU layer. So let's say you have one layer of ReLU. Then what you do is if you look at, so the sigma are the ReLU activation functions. So if you look at this neural network, this basically is stacking of the activation functions. So what you need to make sure you, you do is you basically restrict the weights here to be positive, essentially. You want your biases and the uh, coefficients, you multiply it, right? Your coefficients to be positive. And you build your network stack by stack. You, say you build this sort of staircase in your network this way. You can do this for you know, multi-layer networks, but sort of in one layer, this is very simple to explicitly constrain during the training process. 
So what this has is, as you can constrain the weights in your neural network. By constraining your weights in your neural network, you're guaranteed the stability of your controller. So this is a, uh, sort of a very general result in that sense. Right? So I'll talk a little bit about training and I'll show you some uh, simulation results. I may answer some of the questions in the chat. So uh, for training, we're going to do a discrete time system for training. Uh, the sort of the only tricky thing during training is because we're discretizing a continuous time system, and we need to describe we need to discretize it fairly finely to capture the dynamics in the system. So we end up as you end up with this discretized system with a lot of steps, and then this network parameter theta in the neural network shows up in all the steps. So a straightforward back propagation is sort of slow for this, a little bit slow for this. So what we do is we actually do this using RNN. So one thing you can sense is the controller never changes. Right? So one, it's the same controller you use and you sort of unroll the system in time to see the performance of this controller. What you do is you program this as an RNN cell, so a recurrent neural network cell, and you do back propagation. You can improve the training and we can shave off you know, 25% of the training. So let me show you some of the performances. Let me show you how, how these things perform. So again, we're gonna go back to the 39 bus system. Well, the same metric as before, you know, can you minimize frequency deviation trading off the control effort? We'll have random initializations. We'll keep putting some step disturbances. We'll see how well our this sort of learning approach do. So we're putting a very actually realistic machine model. Okay, we're putting a very realistic machine model. We're putting the six order machine model. Okay, so it has all the bells and whistles of the system you see. So the way the simulation works is it's not a purely inverter driven system. So within the system, we have about say half synchronous machines, half inverters. So the inverters has to play nice with synchronous machines. So we have all the synchronous machines model in it. This is a six order machine model. So where does inverters come in? Inverters you can think of as run basically by this PLL, the phase lock loop. So inverters, what they do is they don't have rotating inertia, but they can measure the frequency changes in the grid through a phase lock loop, right? Once they measure the frequency change in the grid through this phase lock loop, they can do some response. So again, think of as attached to a storage device and they will do some response uh, by you know, charging or discharging from the storage. So we're putting all those models. These are all sort of uh, realistic parameters. We want to see how it does in a system that's uh, mixed between synchronous and inverter based with uh, all of the sort of internal loops in there. Right? So it turns out our simulation, you know, we do very well. Right? Our cost is a lot lower than the linear one. And by linear here, again, we also optimize over the linear control loss. So we do better than the best linear control. And this one example of the control loss you will see, right? So sort of this sort of squiggly lines and there's all kinds of different shapes come up. But I don't have any intuition on why they look like this, but anyways, they're guaranteed to be stable and this is what RL tells us. Right? So we guarantee stability through design. And then really what RL does is for go optimize the exact shape of the control loss. So Alexandro says ending 35 minutes, right? So then this is, so this sort of more detailed simulation, basically uh, we do better than, you know, a lot of better, we use a lot of smaller control effort and we have smaller frequency deviation. So we improve on both uh, costs, okay? So respect to training time. So when we first trained it, we're a little bit worried this will take very long for a large system because it takes about 12 minutes to uh, train the 39 bus system. So we got worried, then we train it for a larger system, 300 bus system. It doesn't take much longer. So most of the training time does not scale with the size of the system, so it's scale with the discretization, the number of discrete time steps we're looking. So that's fine. So we, for even larger system it will not be very long. And of course, warm start helps quite a bit. Right. Warm star will help dramatically if you can do that. Then how about robustness? 
right? So always with machine learning, we worry, are you over tuned for your model, right? Maybe if I train for 39 bus, I can get a better performance. But maybe if the model changes, suddenly my control falls apart. So we have outages in the system all the time. So let's say these two lines have outage. Okay, so I, I train my controllers for the 439 bus system, but now let me have outage. So what I do is I have a step disturbance. I respond to it a little bit. Then at six seconds, I disconnect two of the lines and look at how I do. And I do very, so the controller does very well. It's sort of very stable. It's, it's still stabilizing. And you have small deviations because the lines got disconnected, but very fast, the sort of the uh, frequency goes to the nominal frequency. Right? So it's very robust to this kind of topology changes. And it's not hard to understand well. If you look at the Lyapunov functions we used, none of these conditions has anything to do with the topology, actually. Right? All of this, the fact that you have different topologies does not enter the stability constraints. Whatever topology you have, it's the same constraint. The function has to go through zero, has to be increasing. That's it. Right? So, really, what happens is the stabilities. The stability condition does not depend on topology. What does is optimality does. Right? If you change the topology, whatever you learn may not be optimal. You have to retrain it. Right? You, know, you have to sort of update it online. But you're, you're not afraid that by retraining this, you'll blow up your system because it's not stable anymore. That does not matter. Right? So this is, the stability is always there. It has no dependence on the topology at all. So this is sort of a, you know, this is the result we have for it. But this does not uh, answer all the questions. I think I saw this question in chat. This is saying, what I had is a lossless system. Real system have losses, okay? They have this loss term. And the bad thing is there's, okay, I should not say there's no energy function. There's sort of some sort of energy function you can get, but there's no nice energy functions we can work with. We have some energy functions, but those are very hard to work with. And has for integrals in it. There's no nice energy function you can work with. So, you know, turns out in this case, we have done some work that you actually have to supplement the, the Afnol function itself. You have to use learning not only for controller design, but also to supplement the Afnol function. So another some future question you can ask is, you know, frequency is not the only thing in the system. Right? There's voltages, there's integer, conditions we have in the system, which I did not talk about at all. Of course, then you can think of stability doesn't really go to hard constraints. Of course, to, there may be hard constraints saying you know, the frequency has to be above 59.6. That's hard, that does not, is not directly implied by stability considerations. And so that's something we have to think about. So to conclude is really what I want to say is, you know, Learning can solve hard power system optimization problems. What need to do is need to include the physical constraint, in this case, the energy function, the Lyapunov function. And that both makes the problem easier and more interesting, actually, right? So this sort of, and uh, so lots to do because I think, you know, to have the learning algorithms to meet the power system problem in the middle, there's quite a bit to do. And the last thing we have is, you know, there are some references, you know, with the papers and the code to generate the plot I show in this. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Bao Seng. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Um, I think there are a lot of questions and right. some of those you actually answered. So I'm going to try to see if right. maybe we should start with Duncan's paper, a question. If okay. you have multiple decentralized controllers, Mm -hmm. What is the computational complexity of what you are talking about? And I, there was another similar question. Right. So if I'm so this is trained in a distributed way because this is sort of one controller per uh, device, right? So they only have their own local frequency information. So there's no communication between the controllers. You don't need other people's frequency information. So the training in some sorry. So this in some sense the controller are decentralized. And we try, you know, having delays in the system. We're trying to have simulations where we have delays, and we're trying to simulate this decentralizedly. Or having 
different controllers update online at different rates, it didn't make much difference. It's fairly robust performance. So is there, a, is there a theoretical proof that says if I do it entirely decentralized in response to frequency, the system will stay stable? There is no such lacuna function. Uh, right. So the so one thing you need is each of the controllers should always satisfy the constraints I show. Right? So every, whenever you're updating, you cannot deviate from those constraints. So if you satisfy those, right? So if you stay within those kind of constraints, then whatever controller you come up with is actually civilizing to the system. So if you look at the system at any point in time and say these controllers all have arbitrary, you know, controllers, but as long as they satisfy, you know, it's increasing goes through the origin, you take the, the lead derivative of the Daphna function, it's actually still decreasing. So that's actually a proof in that case. As, as long as you stay in the class, it, it, it's fine. Just to be a little bit more realistic yeah. about this question, for the long time in control community, if I remember late Mike Atans always talking that the Nobel Prize question about in control is if you have saturation or you have constraints, you cannot prove anything. Yeah. How are you getting around that problem? So here we have saturation constraint. We saturate the controller. Yeah, yeah, but then saturation. you cannot yeah. prove anything anymore. Uh, no, so the constraints come in really as upper lower bound. So you still you can have some constraints, you know, do some response and have some constraints. So as long as you can do both positive and negative responses, then you're okay in that sense. Right? So you can do both positive and negative. You but can saturate like your constraints. This but is, uh, yeah. this is saying as long as I stay in this region, I'm okay. But yeah. how do we ensure that you stay in that region? Because in power systems, we have multiple equilibria and things like that. So how do we ensure, you start from some initial conditions, how do we ensure you stay within those constraints? Right, so that's why, so this is not a truly up now function, right? This is only a up now function when angles are bounded between minus pi over two and pi over two. So if you start, start in that region, then you're okay. You have to decrease in that region. If you're outside that region, then we don't know. So this, you know, if, if you're operating very close to the boundary of this region, let's say you have a line disconnect, you jump out of this region, then we don't know. I think okay. that's sort of a hard question for us. Okay, it would be good, I think, to have those disclaimers yeah. because otherwise it's too good to be true. Let's go to another, uh, to another type of questions here. We deal with, um, if you are using a phase lock loop, for example, uh, somebody, yeah. sorry. oh, this is Duncan again. No, sorry, Duncan, you again. Um, you, are, you are studying grid forming converter control design, right? right. Um, then if that's right, what about grid forming inverters? Any obstacles to learning control laws for those? So I think we're using grid following? Or grid, grid forming. In, in other words, it's standalone microgrid and follows its own voltage. It balances itself. It's disconnected from the utility and supports its own voltage is the big area in these microgrids that they can exist by themselves or you connect them and disconnect them. I believe that this is what Duncan, maybe you all can elaborate. Yeah, I'll, I'll clarify. I mean, I, I think I was just, um, maybe the first question is if you're, if you're using a PLL, often people will say then, then that's a grid following converter. Right. Uh, and, and so I was, I was making that assumption right. that you're thinking about grid following. And then, so then if that's right, then the question okay, is. Okay. Then the, then the question is, are, you know, could you also sort of pursue different sorts of grid forming control designs and apply the same? Method? Right. So that's a good question. So Thank I you. think what we need is I need a PLL because I need to measure the frequency between the, I, I need to know what the grid frequency is at. But whether well, I think that's both there in the grid forming and grid following, I can at least measure. And the question is, what should my response be, right? Should I act like a sort of perfect voltage source and not care about the frequency? Or should I do some response? In this case, we're saying you have to be responsive to a frequency change. So there was a question which I'm trying to find out from whom it was. Uh, it, it deals with the, the question of phase lock loop sensitivity control to how well you get. These, these inverters are not rotating. 
So what you are doing, you know, if you go to the math of that, you go from DQ to ABC, right, depending yeah. on which reference frame you choose, is yeah. the reference frame network or is it some absolute reference frame? People in power electronics are very, very dissatisfied now with state of the art in, um, in how well phase lock loop works when you connect it to right. something else, right? <laughs> So uh, how do you have any sense of if we were to extend this further? Right, right. So I don't have a theoretical answer to this. So for example, I don't know how sensitive you know, I am to the face lock loop noise, for example, right? and how fast it locks. But that's why in simulation, we want to actually have a face lock loop in there to have all this, you know, at least simulation wise, to show how well we perform. But it depends what you lock it to. You know, you have all these decentralized controllers, you're right. locking them to different things, and the frequency of the system is maybe inertia right. frequency. Right, so we'll, we'll lock to the terminal frequency. We'll lock to the terminal frequency. We'll, uh, or we'll, we'll, we'll lock to such that we can measure the difference with terminal frequency. So I think, Alejandro, uh, maybe we can have people send more questions and we can do them offline later. But I think this area, because you primarily talked about synchronous machines, basically just, and there was a question about decoupling of real and reactive power. Somebody asked that question. I apologize, I, I can't do it in real time to ask what question, but uh, the minute you add reactive power and you talk to people who have been, who have brought sem seminal uh, results to power systems for Lyapuna functions like David Hill, they are telling you that that question is still an open question. And yeah. inverters are all about coupling with reactive power. Do you have any plans how you go on that? Yeah, so that's the, our next step. Right? So our next step is to use our lossy system. What do we do? There is not a clean energy function. Reactive power, what do we do? There is a good, not a clean energy function. So really sort of, you know, this is just saying that if there's energy function, we're gonna use as much as we can of it. If there's not, it doesn't mean there's no physics or you should just, you know, directly learn it. There's still quite a bit of work in that area. Basically, how do you modify this energy function you know, at different situations? And I think sort of learning can complement this in many ways, but you know. I'm happy to discuss all this more in the break. Well, so. And just to connect the dots there, there has been a lot of work yeah. in the control area, not in <laughs> yeah. on controlling energy shaping, power shaping, yeah. where people do that. So fundamental question is, and I am still struggling, uh, I'm, I'm trying to follow your presentation, but what is that um, this machine learning approach offers uh, relative to the state of the art when you have nonlinear controllers? Nonlinear controllers for inverters, for synchronous machine, there has been tons of work over the last 20 years. Can you comment on that? I think one, uh, just the ease of parameterization, right? So when you have nonlinear controllers, a lot of it is actually some, a lot of hard work to describe the class. You always need to refine yourself to some class. So you need this sort of finite dimensional optimization problem to work over this. So a lot of times you try very hard to you know, find the right class of control laws, but your question, you know, is this broad enough? What, what should this class be? Machine learning something comes in and says, okay, just do a neural network. Right? This is, describes a lot of control laws. So it's a very simple to parameterize. Well, so just, I, a, just a personal bias comment is that now with machine learning, you are still returning to Lyapuna function based. Uh, proofs, which are the same type of proofs used in model-based ones. Right. So yes. what is going yes. on? What is going on? We have to be, the community has to be convinced that for these very fast, unstable things, you know, where you have inverter dynamics and very complicated sub-transients, sub there were a lot of questions of that type. Yeah. Uh, do we really know that Unless uh, you design, there was feedback linearizing control, there was sliding mode control, energy shaping, power shaping. Alejandro did a lot of work on that for inverter control. So uh, that was all model based, the best that I know. So now Bouncing said, it says, well, we only have linear controllers and they don't work. And you don't even mention nonlinear controllers that exist. So I think you should put in context you know, machine learning only goes so far and where are the, where do they complement each other? I think right. that's really important. Yeah, so I think that point is well taken. Right? So I think, you know, it's not, uh, right, so it's machine learning. So if you look at this as, right, so really the way the model-based thing doing is guaranteeing stability. 
right? So what is machine learning doing try to optimize within this class that's sort of identified by the Lyapunov function. And Lyapunov function gave you this class of controllers you should search over. And then machine learning tells you this is a good way to search over this class of controllers. Right. So I think, you know, I think our point is sort of the same is that really you need both, right? In some sense, you, need they need both. Come you really need both. Yeah, so that's this so, is a fair conclusion. Yeah. I don't know if Louis Vekankel is on, on the call now, but the University of Liege people have done a lot of work on early reinforcement learning for transient stability. And uh, I think uh, as we move forward, in particular in that area, where you have fast dynamics that you are describing, uh, they were pioneers in doing this. So the question is, what did they learn from those and how do they compare to what you are proposing? Sort of just generally putting where we are going with machine learning in the context of what we already know, at least in the, in the research side, not necessarily in the industry, would be good. So that people I think don't this... feel now that you are either doing this or that. I think they should complement each other, right? Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I, yeah. I think these are great questions for the panel and um, we are running a bit behind. So why don't we stop here and then take a break uh, uh, to start the next uh, talking time, okay? When are we starting? So I propose that um, we only have we will only have seven minutes break if we start on time. So why don't we start at uh, fifty, the fifty minute uh, mark? So five minutes uh, behind. So at least we have a twelve minutes break. Thank How does you. that sound? Okay, great. Okay, so we we'll see you back in a few minutes. Yep. Great talk, uh, Baujan. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. So, so the first thing that struck me about this was that it reminded me of the talk you gave at Berkeley two years ago uh, on output convex neural networks for building models. Two years ago? Wait, no. Was it two? No. It may have just been one. No, one year ago, right? This is just before uh, the pandemic. But... Yeah, pre-pandemic, pre <laughs> you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it, it reminded me of that and that you're not just blindly using mm. Uh, neural networks, you're basically constraining them to match the physical system that you're applying them to, right? So you can uh, shape the output, essentially, uh, which is a really cool idea, particularly for power systems, because it enables you to give guarantees uh, to Maria's questions, basically, in, in shape energy functions. The, the question um, I had, I think, is starting with slide 27. Are you learning? I'm trying to... to um, sort out exactly what feedback law you're learning. Is it um, basically a map between frequency deviation, or, or sorry, a map between uh, deviations from the power set point to deviations uh, from the frequency? Uh, so your input is a deviation of the to the frequency set point. Okay. And then your action is a change in power, change in active power. And so will there always be uh, some steady state error because the input is the frequency deviation? Is that correct? Uh, right, so that goes back to depend on how well your PIL works, right? Okay. So in practice, you need a little bit of dead end there. If, if you have some error. So if you're not very confident in the PIL, you need a little bit of dead end around there. Okay. And <laughs> is the uh, recurrent neural net does that make the the map between the frequency error to the power uh, change state dependent? Yes, yes of, of course, yes. Yeah. This is this is a sort of continuous. This is a dynamical system, right? So it's sort of everything is a function of the state. So. Okay, so yeah. so the, it, it's not, I guess, like droop control in the sense that it's just a constant law between frequency and power deviations, right? Well, Right, so, uh, so in that, so, okay, I, I see, I understand what you said, but so it's still a static feedback law. Okay. In some sense, the only input takes as a frequency or frequency deviation, then give you a changing grid, right? So this is sort of the, it's just a more complicated form of droop, if you think of that way, right? So droop is still state dependent, right? So it's just linearly dependent. This is just sort of more complicated dependence. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll open yeah. it up if anyone else has questions. Uh, sorry, folks have questions, I guess. We're going to take advantage of the break. Hey, Dr. Zhang. Um, so I just posted the last question from me. I, 
um, it's a little broad, but I just want to see that if you have any, any thoughts on that. Because mm -hmm. now, it seems that your work is trying to you know, mimic the traditional generator uh, to provide the primary frequency control. But indeed, you know, the inverter-based resources that we have, the more advanced, um, uh, faster responding uh, features there. But you know, is I just wondering is how do you fully unlock that value from the faster responding inverter-based resources? So this is part of what we're trying to get to, right? So. I guess if you mimic the synchronous generator, then you try to be the best synchronous generator you can, which you know, in the context of talk I give is you know, just do the best linear thing you can do. Right? So you know, this is one way to unlocking some of this potential is uh, don't try to be the best synchronous generator. You can uh, be, have more freedom, right? optimize the response you want to give. Mm -hmm. So if you're right. trying to go a little bit beyond saying, you know, it's frequency, all that important, then sort of different, uh, set, then there's sort of different games to talk about. You know, the, um, you know I, I chew on this question a little bit, even while I was in the industry. You know, the, um, our power system design is based on the group control for frequency. But that is because, I think it's because we want to each generator just looking at the local frequency and then to um, adjust my uh, my power basically um, right. to 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 compensate the deviation of the frequency. But then that that is basically based on the traditional power grid with uh, the large power uh, the, the generators and like that. And then also uh, you lose the fast computing technology, lose the communication high band. Now you have power electronics, your IGBT, you can, uh, you know, really quick respond to your deviations like that. Mm -hmm. And then your communication, even 5G is coming. And so mm -hmm. it seems like to me, um, if we just mimic the synchronous generators, that is basically we haven't fully utilized the new technology we are, we are having. But definitely I, I agree with you that, you know, FERC has a requirement in the NERC world. Uh, FERC and NERC, the, all the regulators will have put a lot of those constraints on our food, uh, our food and then we um, will definitely need to um, uh, come up with some midway the solutions to uh, first unlock the value and also meet the uh, regulation requirement there. But I just think, I think that at um, you know, universities, sometimes we, we can be a little bit proactive and see if we don't mimic the tra uh, traditional signal generator, how will you design the controllers for the uh, to take right. advantage of responding inverter-based resources then. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. Right? I think we're saying, so I think for one is, you know, if your system is not entirely inverter-based or, you know, there's significant amount of traditional spinning machines, you have to deal with them somehow, right? You're not, mm -hmm. uh, you have to deal with them, you have to play with them, right? So in some sense, you cannot be, you know, too arbitrary in the way you want to behave. Because they will respond to you, no matter what you want to respond to them or not. That's, but you know what? I think your side is correct. Well, let's say we have a microgrid, which is, you know, let's say, ninety percent inverter based or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then really, at that time, you know, is frequency the right thing to look at? Is even a question, right? If I have, you know, high bandwidth communication, half fast control capability, do I really need to measure this thing called frequency that's sixty hertz? You know, is that too slow? Should I communicate faster? I think that's an interesting question. I think that's where uh, you can have more freedom. Right? I think there's sort of many people working on this area, talking about you know if you have many inverters connect to each other, then how should they act? And then you look at the control laws, the oscillators there is really sort of different than what I talked about today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs>